Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. This, I'm Jerry Champlin, president of the League of Women Voters, Comel area, and we're very pleased tonight to bring you the business of journalism. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Roxana Dean to introduce our speaker. Uh, just want to remind everybody that we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan 501c3. We never support political parties or candidates or oppose them. Roxana? Thank you, Jerry. Well, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker this evening. What's better than having someone who actually teaches journalism in this era? Dale Blassingame is an assistant professor of practice in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Texas State University in San Marcos where he received the 2017 Presidential Excellence Award for Teaching. Blasting Game is a part of the Digital Media Innovation faculty, and he teaches courses that introduce students to different aspects of how technology is changing journalism, media, and marketing. Some of his classes include advanced social media and analytics, drone journalism, web design and publishing, fundamentals of digital and online media. Before transitioning to Texas State, Blasting Game was a television news producer. He spent nine years at WOAI TV in San Antonio, where he won two Lone Star Emmy Awards and was nominated for a third. Before that, he was a news anchor and sports reporter for KTSA AM in San Antonio. Blasting Game is a member of the Online News Association, Society of Professional Journalists, and the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. In his free time, he is an avid hiker and traveler. In 2014, he visited all 95 state parks in Texas in one year. And he's on his uh, a mission to visit all 400 national park properties. Dale's dog, Lucy, joins him on trips and loves to hike and climb rocks. Blasting Game and Lucy were included on Texas Highways Magazine list of extraordinary Texans for 2016. And his stories have been featured on TV, radio, digital, and in magazines. He's been able to marry his passions of technology and our parks by creating a course called Mobile Story Storytelling in the Park in conjunction with Texas par Parks and Wildlife where students produce social video content of state parks. In 2017, he was received a grant to develop the School of Journalism and Mass Communications First Study in America course, where he took students to, to do similar work in national parks. He is a member of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, National Park Foundation, Na National Parks Conservation Association, and the Trails Foundation. So I told him before that it was a that conservation and parks and and public spaces was dear to our hearts. So we welcome Dale. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak tonight. Oh yeah, sure thing. I I, I very much appreciate y'all uh, having me. And I I lived in New Braunfels for many years, so I, I'm up in Austin now. But I uh, appreciate y'all uh, having me in. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Um, and um. I'm going to discuss tonight kind of where the, you know, where the industry of journalism stands and then probably the most important problem we're facing in journalism right now. And um, hopefully I tried to time my slides to where I would uh, have some time for Q&A. So uh, I'm hopeful that that will be the case. Um, so I, I want to start first with just kind of a look back at how quickly things have changed, because even just in the I, I left news in 2011, so I've been gone 11 years now. And in that 11 years, so much has changed. Um, you know, growing up, of course, we had the daily paper, which was a routine for so many of us. And for many, and for a lot of us, it might have been a routine in the morning and the evening to get a newspaper. Um, that, of course, has changed dramatically. Um, we had a trusted newsman or newswoman. Uh, deliver the nightly news for us. And numbers have declined greatly when it comes to TV news. Um, I, I grew up watching Brian Williams and he was my favorite for uh, quite some time, which is why I included him here. Uh, but the idea of that being appointment television has, has definitely gone by the wayside. 
in radio news is taking a huge hit. Um, that was already in the process of happening when I was uh, working in TV. Radio was was going the way of opinion rather than a lot of news content. Uh, but we've definitely seen some challenges there. And of course, we've had the rise of digital in this time and, and both from a from a good and a bad standpoint as well. I, I'm not one of those people who believes that all technology is good technology, even though I teach digital. Uh, I'm, I'm very aware of, of the downsides and some of the uh, problems that that technology presents. And more importantly, I I hope our students are going to be the ones who solve those problems um, and by teaching them technology in this way that we'll be able to help guide them in that direction. So I wanted to take a look at some numbers first, just kind of looking at where the industry stands. And I believe this was sent out in a, in a newsletter earlier this week, but the Pew Research Center took a look at where people are getting their news and they compared um, 2020 to 2021. And you'll notice there's a pretty significant drop in all of these platforms, even digital, which that's kind of surprising. So we dropped from 60% to 51% um, digital. Um, TV is still uh, the second most popular uh, news source. A lot of people still watch local news, especially. Um, but I'm always a little um, curious or uh, skeptical whenever I see numbers like this, because I think a lot of people are confused by what is TV news. Um, we've especially seen uh, situations specifically with Fox News of people not understanding the difference between news and opinion. And that of course applies to the other platforms as well, CNN, NBC. Um, and so I have, a, I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of people are writing TV news down on these types of surveys when they might be watching an opinion show uh, on TV. Um, radio has has obviously dropped, uh, and you can see print is you know fallen to uh, kind of frightening numbers at this point. Um, and I, I have an asterisk here next to digital devices because we have to stop and think. Okay, well, what does that mean? What is a digital device? Does that mean they're getting their news from traditional news sources like TV and newspapers just on their phone? Um, which that, of course, is very possible. They could be going to you know, a TV station's website or a newspaper's website, they could be following them on social or as we've seen here lately and what I'm gonna spend the, the second half of this talk um, going through, um, you know, we, we've obviously seen the rise of misinformation coming from individuals on social media uh, and that would obviously count toward digital devices as well. So not all of these are created equal um, is, is kind of the message from that. Um, here's a, a bit of a breakdown. Since the, the Great Recession in 2008, uh, the newspaper industry has lost 40,000 jobs, um, meaning it's down almost 60% of its total workforce. Um, this has created what is known as news deserts in many smaller communities, especially. Um, I know in New Braunfels, you have the Herald Zeitung. Um, Y'all are fortunate to still have a newspaper. Many, many cities the size of New Braunfels or smaller um, have lost their newspapers or their newspapers have gone to like one day edition, one day out of the week, maybe a Saturday edition or something like that. Um, so news deserts are areas where there is no access to local news anymore. They're having to depend on the next big city over in order to get that news. So newspapers traditionally filled that role uh, in these smaller communities. And I don't mean New Braunfels small, but in comparison to San Antonio or Dallas or something like that. Um, radio, um, radio has lost about 26% of its workforce. Radio was nowhere near as big as TV, I mean, uh, print or TV, um, but they've still had quite a number of job cuts um, since 2008. And TV's numbers are relatively flat, um, but that, that's also a bit misleading because we have seen huge uh, layoffs at especially the larger ownership uh, groups just in the past year. I know Sinclair, which owns hundreds of TV stations or safely can say they own dozens of TV stations. I'm pretty sure they own hundreds. Um, Sinclair laid off more than 6,000 uh, folks last year in 2021. Uh, and we're, we're seeing that with uh, a lot of the ownership groups as well. So TV has managed to stay uh, stable uh, but is by no means safe or comfortable in any way. 
And the digital native news workforce is now at around 18,000 plus, um, which a couple of things that I should probably go over here. Digital native does not mean, you know, like KSAT or WAI TV puts their stuff on a website. That's digital news, but a digital native news site would be something like um, the Texas Tribune, uh, which is one of my absolute favorite uh, news organizations uh, anywhere, probably my favorite uh, news organization anywhere. Um, these are newsrooms that are entirely digital product forward. Um, they don't have a print edition. They're not a TV station. They're not a radio station. Now they might appear on all of those other platforms, but their product is made for their website. Um, in San Antonio, you have the San Antonio Report, uh, and there are plenty of other digital native newsrooms throughout the country um, and here in Texas. Uh, but the problem with a lot of these uh, digital native, it's not a problem necessarily, but the, the thing to keep in mind is these digital native newsrooms are often very niche focused, which is good. Somewhere like the Texas Tribune, they entire 100% of their time on Texas politics and policy. Um, so they're able to hire the best of the best um, to cover that one beat, that one niche, uh, but they're not what you would call a traditional newsroom, right? They're not covering uh, anything outside of what's happening at the state capitol or related to Texas politics. Um, and these digital native newsrooms are usually almost always in big cities. So, um, you know, we're pretty fortunate in, you know, in Austin, which is, you know, about a million people, we have uh, a couple of digital native newsrooms, um, but you don't see many of these, if ever, in smaller communities as well. So while the digital native newsrooms are doing really great work, they're not necessarily filling that gap in the news deserts that we've seen in some of the communities that have lost uh, their newspapers or have seen circulation drop in these uh, in these areas. And then, of course, we have social, which is kind of a, a mixed grab bag of what you're going to find there. Um, you know, it, it all depends on how you're using social and what sources you follow and and who you trust. I'm going to be mentioning that word here in a second because we have, of course, seen um, not only the rise of misinformation, but really, I would say it's it's obvious. I, I, I think I'm safe in saying it's worse than ever before. And I don't know that we have a solution in place, even though I am going to go over a couple of things for you to keep in mind toward the end of ways we might be able to help the problem. Um, I know in the description of this talk, um, I, I was asked to, to talk about media literacy. And I do believe this is one of the biggest ways we can fight misinformation. Um, but it takes everyone. It, it takes that herd immunity to bring a COVID term uh, to a journalism discussion. Um, the Pointer Institute uh, talks about media literacy as users' ability to identify and consume news more responsibly. Uh, it's about knowing where you're getting your news from and knowing whether you can trust that source. Um, and again, I have an asterisk here because I think we now trust differently than we did in the past. I think um, our ideas of, you know, we used to, you know, there's always the old saying of, um, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, now I think misinformation has thrown that saying especially on its head. And I think there are people who are, uh, who are at least under the belief that they're entitled to their own facts. And so um, this idea of who we trust and why we trust, um, you know, is it politically motivated? Is it um, financially motivated? There's lots of reasons why trust is no longer a simple term to define when it comes to journalism or storytelling. Um, and speaking of trust, again, the Pew Research Center just released this report a few weeks ago, um, showing how partisan gaps are widening when it comes to trust. Um, and just taking a look here, I mean, here's 2020, right? So this is the 2020 election. You see the big spike down with all three, but especially when it comes to Republican uh, voters or voters who lean Republican, um, this idea of trust in national news obviously was, um, you know, has always been at the forefront of, uh, of Republican thought, I would think it's safe to say, but even Democrats um, or people who lean Democrat uh, have lost some trust 
in the national news media. Local media is obviously higher, but there's still a gap there. And then when it comes to social media, you can see it's much, much lower um, when it comes to that. And again, I would, I would put a big asterisk on this because, um, you know, we're always way more apt to trust people who we, uh, who we think are telling us what we want to hear or what we believe to be true. Uh, and so, you know, just it, keep that in mind anytime you see surveys like this. I love the Pew Research Center. Uh, but again, this idea of trust isn't so easy to define anymore uh, when it comes to this. And if we think someone's telling us the truth, we're way more apt or likely to, to trust them than if we're having to think critically and actually, um, you know, hear some news that may not be what we uh, believe to be the case. And so, um, that that's an interesting perspective that even as I was putting this together last night, I was I was really struggling with that idea of truth. Um, I show this with my students every semester because um, this is a group at Fontes um, where they do this methodology every year that's very in depth, um, and they go through an increasing number of newspapers, digital products, TV, radio, podcasts, and they monitor their content uh, and put a pretty rigorous methodology behind this. Uh, and so what this is showing is if you are looking from the bottom up, this is reliability, okay? So who can you trust more? Um, and then if you look left to right or right to left, this is partisanship. So I like to tell them that it doesn't matter what political beliefs you have, there are sources up here in the top third or top fourth that are very reliable when it comes to uh, news and reporting and, and you can feel pretty safe trusting them. And you notice some of these are broken up into different departments. So like CNN TV is right here, but the CNN website is up here. And same with Fox News, like the Fox News TV channel down here but their website is, is way up here, right? So they're, they break it down even into those differences. So um, I get a lot of questions from students of like, you know, my grandmother or my grandfather or my uncle um, doesn't believe anything on the news, where can they start? Um, and I oftentimes point them to this, to this chart and, you know, go with something up here in this realm. I had one student who um, she did that and she had her mom watch a PBS NewsHour and um, she came back to me the next semester and said, my mom watches it every night now. And she actually um, has developed a, a trusting relationship with them, which was um, great to hear. Um, and I think we all know what the alternative of that is. Um, so, you know, we have anti-vax communities on the, the very far left. We have anti-vax communities on the far right. We've got, um, you know, the misinformation that led to um, the Capitol riot uh, as well. So um, this stuff matters and it's very difficult and there is no easy answer to the problems that um, the platforms are facing right now and also what we as users of these platforms are facing at the moment. Um, so I wanna segue into misinformation here since I just brought that up. And it's important to know that misinformation has been around forever. Um, as long as cavemen developed the uh, ability to communicate with each other, whether that was through drawings or uh, crude language, we've always lied to each other. Um, so that is nothing new. Um, it's just changed and developed so much so rapidly because even when I was a small child, this was misinformation, but we could still look at the tabloids and the HEB checkout line and no, that's ridiculous, right? Like none of this we knew wasn't true, but sometimes it was so crazy that we would still buy them because we wanted to be entertained by those stories. And I should say these tabloids still exist. Um, I saw the Weekly World News yesterday in line at HEB, and we now have things like Us Weekly and Plus that are more entertainment focused that are constantly full of misinformation as well. Um, we just have the new generation of tabloids that are packaged to look more like regular magazines. The problem now is when we see misinformation on social, it's made to look exactly like every other post. And so we don't have the advantage of seeing a cover like this and going, well, that's ridiculous. That's obviously not true. Um, because 
it all looks the same. It looks the same as whether it's a, a reputable news source reporting it, or if it's a website, someone just simply made up on their own and decided to post a fake study um, and share that information as well. And so we've obviously got um, a lot on our hands when it comes to this problem and, and whether it's researching this problem or even just trying to muddy or uh, get through the waters of finding news and information these days, it's, it's never been more difficult. Um, and the reason why that this has exploded is because of the algorithms of these different platforms. I originally had um, some pretty in the weeds stuff here regarding um, how the, the algorithms work, but I'll just simply say the algorithms are there to try and get you to stay on the platforms more. So Facebook has an incredibly strong algorithm. Instagram has a strong algorithm. TikTok has probably the smartest algorithm we've ever seen. Um, YouTube has an incredibly strong algorithm. So these platforms are trying to get you to stick around. And so they develop formulas to figure out what content to show you. Uh, and they've put in um, different preference levels for what users show them as leading to them sticking around. Um, so things like long comments uh, are seen as really positive things in the algorithm's eyes. But in fact, if you stop and think about it, like long comments probably mean we're just arguing with each other, right? But to the platforms, that's a very positive thing. Facebook had a um, an algorithm change in 2018, I believe, 2019. It was their latest big algorithm change that just prioritized long comments. Uh, and Mark Zuckerberg said, well, it's because people are leaving long thought out discussions. And that is exactly the opposite of what's happening. It's people screaming at each other and writing, you know, short form novels to do so. Um, so these algorithms are there and people who produce misinformation and disinformation learned very quickly how to game the system. They knew what type of content to produce that would get engagement, and get the eyes of the algorithm uh, in order to be seen by as many people as possible. And they do this for many reasons. It's not all just partisan. And I'll, I'll go over some of those reasons here in just a second. Um, you probably notice I haven't used the term fake news at all in this talk. And there's a, a reason why um, fake news has, you know, it was a term that was invented by Craig Silverman in, I believe, 2014, 2015. Um, he's one of the very, uh, leading researchers in this and now works um, at a think tank up in, I believe he works at ProPublica now actually. Um, but um, the, the term got weaponized, it got politicized, it became an insult um, to say to someone who you didn't believe what they were saying, oh, that's just fake news. Um, and so once that happens and once everyone is saying everything is fake news, it's obviously lost its purpose and it's lost its meaning. And so we've changed how we talk about this topic uh, in journalism and you know, in the academic world when we're actually studying this. And we use two phrases to describe this. Um, one is misinformation and the other is disinformation. And so um, you've probably seen misinformation quite a lot because I think even mainstream media are now coming around to the fact of, of replacing fake news with this word. And what misinformation means is the inadvertent sharing of false information. So we probably all practice misinformation at one point or another, um, whether we knew it or not. Um, we probably didn't do it maliciously. Um, we just thought something was true and it wasn't. I know I have. I've shared um, plenty of things uh, that ended up not being real. And I always feel ashamed of myself because I teach this stuff. I should know better. Um, but that's misinformation. Um, disinformation kicks things up a notch, and disinformation is the deliberate creation and sharing of information that is known to be false. So you can't really have misinformation without disinformation, if that makes sense. And I, I usually use Joe Rogan and Alex Jones to um, describe this, where I've, for years, I, you know, Joe Rogan's kind of the hot name now in misinformation circles. Uh, if you haven't been following the news, his, his podcast has come under fire for um, sharing a lot of misinformation related to the COVID vaccine. Um, but he's been doing that for years though, not related to COVID, but other topics as well. Um, but he, even under his own admission, says it's usually because I don't do enough 
pre-show research and I go down rabbit holes and start talking about things that I don't know a whole lot about. And so, yeah, I might fall for things um, more easily than someone else. Um, so he's more on the misinformation side, whereas Alex Jones and, and InfoWars is definitely on the disinformation side when it comes to the type of content they're creating. And there are seven types of misinformation. This is an organization called First Draft that does amazing work in this field. Um, and they've labeled these seven types of misinformation. And uh, I'm gonna show you a real quick example of each of these. Um, but it starts from the left, starting with satire, which you know is The Onion or Saturday Night Live and works all the way to the right with content that is 100% false and is made to cause problems and chaos. Um, so I'm gonna show you again an example of all of these, but satire is again, The Onion, Saturday Night Live, it's, it's there to poke fun at or um, you know spoof, um, but it does have potential to cause harm. I've seen people all the time who fall for Onion articles. Um, false connection is when headlines and visuals don't match or when headlines and content don't match. Um, misleading content is taking an argument and twisting it basically where it's like kind of true but it's not really true. Um, false context is taking actual content but using it in a in a wrong in the wrong context. Um, imposter content is pretty self-explanatory. That's when someone's posing as someone else. Um, manipulated content is Photoshop. Uh, that's pretty, the, that's the easiest word to keep in mind when you think about manipulated content is just stuff that's been photoshopped. And then that fabricated content is just pure disinformation. Um, so I want to show you a, a quick example of, of all of these, and then I'll wrap up with um, some of the things that we can do um, to potentially stop this. So I mentioned The Onion uh, as one of the prime sources of parody. Um, and this was an article that hit their website last night. So it's generally poking fun at politicians, at the big story of the day, things along those lines. Um, that's what The Onion does, again, much like Saturday Night Live or, or something along those lines. Um, false connection, again, remember, is when the headlines don't match what the story is actually about. Um, and this is, a, this is a Hall of Fame example from that, um, where I would usually ask my students, what's wrong with this headline? Um, oftentimes, head, uh, false connection stories have what are called clickbaity headlines, clickbait, hoping you will click the headline, because usually they want to fill you full of ads after that. Um, and, you know, the problem, of course, with this is Trump isn't 92 years old. So this woman hasn't been waiting 92 years to meet him because he's 75 or 76. Um, and if you would actually click on that headline, the story has absolutely nothing to do with this woman um, being obsessed with Trump or anything like that. It, it's, it's very weird, these false connection stories. But honestly, all they're trying to do is get you to click a headline so that you can be shown ads. Um, misleading content, again, is content that's kind of true, but it's told in a very misleading way. So this was an ad that was placed by the North Dakota Democratic Party uh, in the last election. Uh, and it said, attention hunters, which obviously there's a lot of hunters in North Dakota, and said, hey, if you vote, you might lose your hunting license in other states. It was kind of true because, yes, other states had laws on the books that you had to be a resident of that state in order to get a hunting license. And a lot of people in North Dakota apparently have hunting licenses in the surrounding states. But those other states have never enacted that law or never put it into uh, play. So yes, it was true, but it was very clear that the North Dakota Democratic Party was trying to get hunters who probably lean very Republican to not vote, um, to, to hit this misinformation with them uh, and mislead them when it comes to that. Um, false context is taking actual context and using it in a different way. Um, so a lot of these accounts that you see on Twitter, especially, which are like this day in history or something along those lines, they steal people's photos, use copyrighted material, and a lot of times just make up a story to go with it. Um, and this is exactly what happened here where, you know, this account says two and a half year old sister being protected by her four year old brother in Nepal, amazing photo. Well, the actual photographer after this went viral 
posted that's actually my photo it's in vietnam taken in 2007 has nothing to do with nepal or what you're talking about so the photo was real it's just this this account made up the story um, that goes along with it um, imposter content we see a ton of it in sports um, people love to uh, impersonate reporters uh, and here's an example of peter king who's one of the biggest reporters in the NFL, probably the most well-known reporter in the NFL, but he even fell for this imposter content, which if you would have taken a second to stop and look at this, um, probably should have had some doubts. And especially if you take a look at the username, should have had some doubts. But this is an example of imposter content pretending to be a reporter with the NFL network. Um, we've seen a lot of manipulated content. Obviously, again, this is Photoshopped. If you remember back a couple of years ago with the, uh, the protest over the summer um, when then President Trump stepped across the street and took this picture with the Bible, um, a lot of people instantly made the connection that Hitler posed in the very same uh, way and we had big celebrities post this. Well, here's the actual photo. So someone had manipulated the Bible on top of it. And then we have fabricated content, which is just purely made up. And this is I always feel kind of bad showing this example because this poor woman probably was sharing this right at the beginning of COVID, thinking that she was doing her friends a solid. Uh, but she shared this letter from a hospital in Kansas City that said, to whom it may concern, after extensive research, our findings show that consuming alcoholic beverages may help reduce the risk of COVID. Vodka is the most recommended for drinking, cleaning, and sanitizing. And it got to the point where Tito's even had to come out and say, hey, this is not true. Um, please don't use our, our stuff to clean and sanitize your house. Um, this letter, the hospital had to come out and say, this is not our letterhead. That's a logo from like three logos ago. Um, this signature makes no sense. Um, it's signed Kansas City. Um, so there were all kinds of problems with this letter. This was a piece of disinformation that this woman then spread through misinformation. I'm, I'm assuming she spread this not knowing that it wasn't real, but someone created this in order to confuse people and cause chaos. Um, but that's not all. <laughs> um, the, the next generation of, of this is really what concerns me. Uh, and we don't know a whole lot about it right now, to be honest. And that's the whole world of deep fakes. Um, I'm gonna show you an old clip from uh, comedian Bill Hader uh, was on the Letterman show uh, several years ago. This is probably a 10 year old interview, but about two and a half years ago, um, someone who is very involved in the deep fake world and deep fake technology um, took this interview that he did and Bill Hader does impressions and started working in the actual person's face of who Bill Hader was doing impressions of onto the video. And so that's what deep fakes are. It'll look like um, it's someone actually saying something when they're not. And so it, again, this goes back to that whole idea of trust. We've always had that saying of, you know, I have to see it to believe it. Well, deep fakes are now showing it to you and you still can't believe it. And so here's just a short clip of um, the Bill Hader deep fake that went viral. And then I'll show you where it's gone from here. I, I, I was wondering about the one, the, uh, the Tropic Thunder. Yeah, where, Tropic Thunder. Where, where <laughs> Tom Cruise, you're working with Tom Cruise. What was that experience like? Uh, it was amazing. Like, uh, we got to dance together. Uh, <laughs> that was amazing. Um, we had, like, uh, you know, when you do a movie, you do table reads, you know, where, like, all the uh, actors get together. At the and beginning of the At the production. beginning, before anything, you get together and you read through the script. And um, so it's, like, you know, all these heavyweights, like, you know, Ben Stiller, Jack Black, Robert Downey Jr., everybody. And at the end is, like, me. Like, you know, like, hey. Happy to be here, guys. <laughs> and uh, some other supporting guys, and then uh, and then Tom Cruise walks in, and even those guys. Like, if you notice, his face is now shifted. <laughs> now it's shifted back. Yeah, oh, boom! <laughs> you know, like, he's immediately excited uh, <laughs> when he walks into a room. So this was really the first kind of instance of deep fakes going viral because for a lot of us we had never seen this technology before even though it's obviously been around for quite a while and for some reason tom cruise is the uh the deep fake king even though he has absolutely nothing to do with it um the most famous deep fake account on tiktok 
is this account called Deep Fake Tom Cruise. And this is not Tom Cruise. This is an actor who is digitally manipulating his face to look exactly like Tom Cruise um, and either impersonating him or using Tom Cruise audio. And in fact, I wanna show you this one because this is the real actor, which he does look a lot like Tom Cruise, but when he falls, now when he pops back up, this is deep fake Tom Cruise where now it has uh, overimposed or superimposed um, the facial recognition on there. Um, this is what really concerns me because you can probably see the instant ramifications of whoever's in office at the time, you know, starting World War III and us thinking that video to all be true when they may not have ever said anything of what they uh, were accused of saying. And in fact, just last month, um, the Independent in UK did a test on these deep fake Tom Cruise videos, told the audience these are not real videos, and the audience still believed them to be true, even though they were told that these were not really Tom Cruise doing those things. Um, so I mentioned that there are many reasons why people do this, and I'll wrap up here in just a second. Um, and this ranges all the way from kind of shoddy journalism, which you know, those first, you know, on the far kind of left of the, you know, not super harmful side of misinformation um, parody, obviously, but then you start getting into um, the stuff that is the real reasons why a lot of people do these, which is obviously partisanship and political influence. Um, profit is probably the biggest reason why there is massive, massive money and misinformation. And most of the time, these are foreign entities uh, foreign people who are using the American political landscape to profit um, with misinformation. They have no care whether you vote for someone or someone else. They're just creating misinformation or disinformation um, to profit off of it by getting clicks and getting those stories shared on social. Um, as for the platforms, they're trying to stop misinformation. Um, they've done a lot of stuff to their credit. None of it has really worked all that well, um, but they are trying. Um, I think the general message from a lot of us is to simply try harder. The problem is it's whack-a-mole. Once you solve one problem, um, the people who are creating disinformation and spreading, spreading it are one step ahead of the people who are then fixing uh, at least part of the problem. And so that, that becomes an issue. Um, so what can we do? You know, these aren't gonna solve the problem by any means, um, but I, I think they do help. And I try to practice these at all times. One is to read before you share something. And that sounds um, way too common sense, but um, you know, anytime I have a talk like this, I stop and ask how many times have you shared a, a piece of content on social media without actually clicking on the article? It happens millions of times every single day. So. A lot of times with these pieces of misinformation, if you actually clicked on the article instead of just seeing the headline and saying, oh, I got to share this, if you actually clicked on the article, you would probably notice pretty soon that it's not a real story or that there's something fishy going on with that story. Um, you know, we've talked about media literacy today, so getting your information from reputable sources, no matter what your political leanings and asking questions of the content. Um, the National Association for Media Literacy Education put this little list of questions together um, that you can ask. This is actually for parents to talk with their kids about misinformation. Um, and these are great questions to ask, not just for kids, but for us as well. Anytime you read a piece of content, um, keeping these things in mind will help tell a lot about what the purpose of that story is. Um, and um, that's not to say you have to do it every time, but if you do have red flags about something, uh, it's really good to go through these lists of questions. Um, I talk about being a truth evangelist, which means reporting content that's false or misleading, no, letting your friends and family know when they're sharing this information. Um, I have an uncle, love him to death. He shares misinformation every single day. Um, I'm usually the one person in his comments saying, hey, this story isn't real. Um, and that doesn't necessarily stop him, but at least I know that I'm trying my best. Maybe it'll affect one of his friends from sharing it if they see somebody talking about it not being real in the comments. So I still go through that, that hassle of doing that. 
And then the final thing is to pay attention to the warning signs. Um, you know, the platforms have added a lot of warnings, um, Twitter and Facebook in particular, TikTok has warnings uh, when there's stuff that's questionable or if it's about a topic that is a frequent topic of misinformation. Um, they're not 100% foolproof, but they can help us kind of stop and take a step back and think, is this real or not? Um, and oftentimes that, you know, that red flag is all we need to, to hopefully kind of get our wits about us and stop and think about content before we hit the share button or before we um, take it as gospel that it's actually true. So um, with that, I will stop right there and I have a couple of minutes to answer any questions if y'all have any. So do you think that there's ever, um, do we need, or would we even want the government to get more involved with trying to set some sort of standards for the, especially like for Facebook and so that they change their business model? Is there a way to try to get them so that they could actually make more money if they if they did a better job? So it's a tough question to answer because on one hand, having it, it's going to be dependent on who's in office at the time, right? Because if you have one party in office, 50% of the other, or, you know, 50% of the country is now going to be dubious of that intervention um, and thinking it was done from a political purpose um, and, you know, flip it for the other party and, and whatever. Um, I will say that you, you may have heard of Section 230 in the news quite a bit here in the past couple of years. Um, then President Trump issued an executive order against the social networks um, with a hope of getting Section 230 of the FCC code overturned. Um, Section 230 is protection for any digital entity. It was created I want to say like in the early 90s, don't quote me on that, but it, it's been around for way before the plat the social platforms were ever around. And it was, it was created to protect like online newsrooms. It was in the birth of the web. And what section 230 says is that you're not, or a digital entity is not responsible for what its users post on that entity. So, you know, think about it again from a newsroom perspective. We've got these news things called websites um, in the you know in the early '90s, and newsrooms were posting stories. Well, if someone went on there and posted an image of child porn in one of the comments, they were responsible, not the newsroom, right? The newsroom could delete it and not face criminal charges or anything like that. So that's the 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 genesis of Section 230. It's now been applied to the social platforms when they came around to where. Facebook is not responsible for what any user posts on Facebook. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because then President Trump tried to use 230 to go after the platforms. And Biden has also said, I might use 230 to go after the platforms, but they're both coming at it from polar opposite ideas. Um, Biden's idea is more of what you're talking about, where the platforms need to be held responsible for being mass spreaders of misinformation. Um, so I don't know if that will happen. Um, he's kind of backed away from, from doing that. Um, and there are obviously some politicians who that's one of their prime focuses with that. So there is definitely talk of those types of things happening. Um, but I don't know that there's anything in the pipeline that even looks realistic at this point that would ever kind of cut it off at that base level, like you're suggesting. I mean, it would be great if they could, um, but I don't know that Pandora's box has been opened and I don't, I don't know how that would ever go back to, um, you know, Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO of Twitter. Um, well, actually it was Mark Zuckerberg last year when they were going back or two years ago when they were going back and forth over um, permanently suspending Trump from their platforms. Zuckerberg said, we will not be the arbiters of truth. And Jack Dorsey um, said, hey, I'm fine being an arbiter of truth. It's my platform. I need to know what's being told and said on my platform. And so there was a, 
this idea of the arbiters of truth um, where the, the platforms themselves, that was kind of one of the first times we've actually seen a CEO of one of the social platforms say, yeah, I'm responsible for, for what is done on my platform. Um, so it's a very vague way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. Okay. Are you, are your students that you see, are, do you, is there cause for hope or are the students when, when they get to you, are they, are they media literate? Are they more aware of these things and maybe older yeah. generations? I think they are, um, I oftentimes, I, I have a fifth point on that well, what can we do uh, list that I took off for this talk. My first point is almost always be aware. Just knowing that this is a problem is half the battle. Um, and my students, I do get a sense, are very aware. Um, and I, I get a sense that's why they don't read a lot of news anymore because they're so fed up with not knowing who to trust or what to trust. Um, and, and so I, at the very, you know, core level, I do get the sense that they understand the problem and the dynamics of it. Um, and you had a second part to that question that I've totally blanked on. No, just it gives you some hope. I mean, that yeah, um, I, in general, am very hopeful with this generation of students. Um, they get a very bad rap and, I have found almost everything to be the polar opposite with that. Um, they are so um, connected to ideas and causes more so than my generation ever was. Um, and I, I get a, I always tell them like, hey, no pressure, but y'all have got to solve all the problems that we created. Just like we always said to the generation ahead of us, like, you know, we're going to be responsible for paying all the debt that you've racked up now we're telling the next generation, hey, you've got to solve all these technical problems that, we, um, that we've kind of opened up and created with that. And so, um, you know, I, I, I know this talk probably seemed very depressing, um, but I, I do hope that there will be some sort of solution at some point. And, and the platforms have done some decent things. TikTok, especially during the election, and the beginnings of COVID, I think, did a really great job at, at separating misinformation and weeding it out. And then it was just like the gates opened up and something happened. It was like they could only withstand it for so long. And then it was just like pff, a, a deluge of, of misinformation. And, you know, YouTube's kind of always been a, a flood of it. And Facebook, of course, has been a flood of it as well. Um, so the platforms have had some successes. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, they have the smartest people in the world working in a lot of these platforms and they have more money than they know what to do with. So I'm hopeful at some point that they're going to figure a solution to this problem out. And, um, I don't know the, you know, the down, the downside of it is the problem is us, you know, we're the ones and not us, but like humans right. and it's not Consumers. the platforms. Yeah. The, the platforms are merely allowing it to happen. It's the users that are creating this content, sharing this content, uh, believing this content, and making actions based on those um, on that content. And and so it's not necessarily a, in my opinion, it's you know the algorithms obviously have a lot to do with it, but we have to change our behavior. Um, you know, it, it's we've always lied to each other. It's just now it's way easier to do it and get mass spread on it as opposed to, you know, you used to have, when we would talk about conspiracy theorists, to use a, a term that gets thrown around a lot, you know, they were in a very tight circle, right? It was like the little group of, you know, the stereotype of the tinfoil hat sitting in a basement, sharing these ideas with each other. And they would only go into that basement, right? It would never leave that basement. And now it's so easy for that type of information to spread and not only spread, but look legitimate and be just truthful enough or just, you know, like the slightest kernel of some sort of legitimacy to oftentimes fool a whole lot of people into making some really dangerous decisions. Um, that, you know, that's a very concerning thing. And again, that's what worries me more than anything. Yeah, when you're teaching, I, 
Go ahead, Jerry. If um, I, yeah, I, I did have a question about the deep fakes because that is something I've been very concerned about, you know, just reading the little bit about it. Is there a way to, for us as consumers, to, to, to check to see if if like a picture or a video that we see is real? Yeah, that when they're done well, it's really hard. Like the the good news with a lot of deep fakes right now is they're sloppy enough to where the the naked eye might be able to say, wait, that doesn't look right. Um, but you saw with those Tom Cruise examples, I mean, those are perfect. Um, yeah. And right now they're being used with Tom Cruise. <laughs> um, but there have been Vladimir Putin deep fakes and there have been Barack Obama deep fakes where they're saying, you know, things that they never said. Um, and that's kicking it up to the, the really worrious, really worrisome level. Um, there are, you know, that it all goes back to the source. Um, and, you know, who is, who is the one sharing that piece of content where uh, there's a term that first draft uses called provenance, which is who is the original creator of that content. And if you can't find the original creator of that content, major red flags um, are going off. So if someone's sharing a video and it's on a YouTube channel from someone's name who you don't recognize and they have no affiliation with anyone and you can't find that video being used anywhere else, like, you know, think about like world leaders, they have cameras on them 24 mm seven. -hmm. If that's the only source that it has them saying this thing, that doesn't 100% mean it didn't happen, but major, major red flags. And the problem is, I don't know that anyone is willing to kind of stop and take that breath and figure out, okay, do I have red flags about this? Because we're just so apt to believe one way or another based on our own political beliefs as to whether something is true or not. Um, and so, yeah, deep fakes scare the ever-living bejesus out of me. Um, mm. And they're only getting better, uh, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Again, so much of this <laughs> is depressing. I don't, I don't mean this to- Well, uh, it's, it's getting to the point where I feel like if I don't see it on the PBS NewsHour, I'm going to, I'm going to be really careful about believing it. <laughs> it's, um, it, it all goes back to that, you know, even I'm trying to phrase this in a way that won't upset anyone. Um, just because they're your friend doesn't mean you can trust them and what they're sharing on social, especially. Um, and we all fall trapped to that. It's not one party over another um, you know, a lot of the research that is, has been done shows that, um, there is more Republican misinformation spread, but it's also because people who are creating Republican misinformation are much better at it than people who are creating Democrat related misinformation. Um, and so, you know, is it, is it spreading because people are more willing to believe it? Is it spreading because it looks more real? Um, it, it just, you know, we don't quite know what's going on in people's heads when they're, when they're sharing that. So, um, yeah, it's, it all goes back to that idea of provenance, um, and, and journalists make mistakes. That's not to say, you know, newsrooms are 100% perfect, but, you know, you have a good, hopefully with media literacy, you have a pretty decent idea of who does good quality work and who doesn't and what reporters you can trust and what reporters are more willing to take a chance on a shaky story. Um, um, you know, I would have never have guessed Dan Rather would have his career ended because of a, a situation. Brian Williams, who I showed earlier, had his, you know, nightly news career ended for um, stretching the truth. Uh, and, you know, I loved him to death. Like that, that was a, a major bummer when that happened. And um, so, even even though you you have an idea of who to trust we you know the days of walter cronkite where the entire country trusted one person those days are long gone yeah um jackie asked i i do have to run in like one minute i i apologize but jackie asked in the chat um should it help to question any source and yeah i mean that's it's kind of the bottom line is um you know i 
I have certain sources that I, you know, I mentioned the Texas Tribune and there's my alarm telling me I have to go. Um, I, I have mentioned the Texas Tribune and I'm, I'm way more apt to believe anything that they say. Um, but, you know, I'm sure the Tribune's made mistakes from time to time too. Like uh, that doesn't mean that they're gonna be perfect just because I really adore their work. Well, great, uh, Dale, thank you so much for this. It was, it's been eye-opening, maybe a little depressing, but more, I think it gave us a lot to think about and that it, I like the idea that it's, it's our responsibility. We, we all have to take our own uh, measure and don't share something unless you check it. So thank you so much for, for giving us your time tonight. Thank, thank you all yeah. so much for the work that you thank do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This is wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Jerry? Yes. Um, thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, Mr. Wading, did you have a comment? Oh, I, I, I had a couple of points. I don't think it's important in this context uh, uh, for your guest, uh, but thanks for doing this. This was great. I am disappointed that uh, you didn't have 500 people on your call. Uh, because I, th I thought it was a great primer, a great introduction to, you know, uh, many, many of the secrets. And uh, Carl, who's with us tonight, uh, uh, and his organization are working on a, uh, through a media action group uh, to understand some of the problems that we heard tonight. Yeah. And, uh, I, I just, I really appreciate this because it, it broadens my thinking. Thank you. Greg and Carl are from uh, Braver Angels. Okay. Yes. Well, we will be, we will be posting this on uh, YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I think we'll probably have a link to the, the video on our website and uh, it has been recorded on Facebook Live. Um, I, I hope people can now see, I'm sharing, um, Roxana put together uh, media literacy, a couple of pages on our website that has a lot of good information, a lot of great links. Um, so if you, if you go to our website and you click on that media literacy link, um, there's just, a, a, you know, some of the charts uh, that Dale shared um, are included, but we will also share a recording of this, as I said, on our YouTube channel. Um, it'll be on uh, Facebook Live, and I think we'll have a link to that on our website. So if you want to refer back to the program or refer someone else to it, um, we have found that keeping these recordings available means that more people do have a chance to see it who couldn't join us tonight. Yeah, I think we would like to probably send this to all of our subscribers um, just to, you know, make them aware of it. it he did a great job. Yes. It was really good. And I, and I could see all the things I fell for. In fact, what I did, what I didn't realize as much is that some of the stuff is not related to news to get advertising to, you know, it's, it's actually to just um, some random person can be posting this stuff to get the clicks. And then from the clicks, they can put, they can get ads in there and it doesn't have to be, you know, related to an actual news news source at all. Yeah. And then, of course, the other one is I, I know I fell for one of those, you know, using a celebrity to promote something. This was <laughs> Phil, Mickels Phil Mickelson, a golfer, right? And it's this picture of him and it says, you know, he wants to bring this at a reasonable price to everybody because it's worked miracles for him. And it was, you know, one of the CBD things. And I was thinking, oh, well, I'll give it a try because it won't be as expensive. And Phil says it's working for him, but maybe it'll help my golf game. And it, and it came in, it didn't make any difference. And, um, you know, I still haven't gotten around to canceling the monthly thing that I didn't know I was <laughs> signing up for. So it's just, 
crazy. Yeah, uh, I know I've been guilty and I don't do it anymore. Um, in the past, uh, you know, I would share things on Facebook that came from a friend of mine. So I, I would assume that they had checked it out. Well, I found out that wasn't always the case. Um, so I, I try to be a lot more careful about that. Um, and, I, and I think that's something we all have to recognize too, is sometimes very well-meaning people, friends of ours that we know may share something because they believe it. That doesn't mean it's true. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any other comments or questions? Um, if there aren't, I am going to stop the recording. Uh, just remind people that this will be available on YouTube. Um, and we do invite you to uh, check out our website, um, check out our Facebook page or our YouTube videos. Thank you very much. Thank you.